Welcome to the program. We began this evening with another consideration of the threat from ISIS. We talked to Ryan Crocker, the former ambassador, and Tom Friedman, the New York Times columnist. I think uh, ISIS uh, today is stronger, better armed, better funded, and more experienced uh, than the Al-Qaeda of Osama bin Laden that brought us 9-11. There are thousands of them who have Western passports, including Americans. So uh, I, I certainly wouldn't bet um, uh, the Capitol building uh, that they are unable at, at the present time to uh, carry out an operation uh, against the American homeland. Uh, it was chilling for all of us, the uh, beheadings of uh, uh, Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff. Uh, I was reminded of another beheading of, of Danny Pearl. Uh, right. That was done by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the principal operational architect of 9-11. Uh, it's the same ideology, just a lot more capability. Ryan and I were reminiscing about being in Beirut together 32 years ago uh, during the Lebanese Civil War and Sabra and Shatila. And one of the things I learned from that experience was watching the Marines come into Lebanon. And one of the conclusions that I drew from that experience is that when you have no political center, then everyone is aside. And the minute you intervene in Beirut, uh, 30 years ago, when there was no political center, the Marines became another side. In fact, the Lebanese used to call them the American militia. And what Ryan's suggesting and what I was suggesting in my column today is that without an Iraqi, uh, in effect, national unity coalition of Sunnis, Kurds, and Shiites, that we can be fighting for that to defend Iraqi national unity and a pluralistic future, not fighting on behalf of the Shiites or let alone the Shiites back or Iran. We conclude this evening with Whit Stillman. His film is called The Cosmopolitans. Baby. Well, this is not bad. No people kill to have this. Plus, you can even see the sun from the view. It's really amazing. Vue imprenable. But can I still use the kitchen downstairs? No. No, the, the locataires, they, they are to arrive at any moment, and they have paid for the use of the entire apartment. All I could do, it was nothing. But you have the warm plate, no, boiling pot, water from the faucet. So the secret for me with Metropolitan was I happened to fall in to that world, the dead party world, with a group of very funny people, really major funny. They could have earned their living with jokes, but they didn't. And I was able to kind of have those characters. And, and this is true, too, with the Cosmopolitans, I think. These are exceptional, interesting characters, I think. Ryan Crocker, Tom Friedman, and Whit Stillman, when we continue. Funding for Charlie Rose is provided by the following. There's a saying around here, you stand behind what you say. Around here, you don't make excuses. You make commitments. And when you can't live up to them, you own up and make it right. Some people think the kind of accountability that thrives on so many streets in this country has gone missing in the places where it's needed most. But I know you'll still find it when you know where to look. Additional funding provided by... And by Bloomberg, a provider of multimedia news and information services worldwide. From our studios in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. We begin this evening with the president in Europe trying to deal with two crises, the threat of Russia in Ukraine and the threat of ISIS in Iraq. A video emerged yesterday of kidnapped American journalist Stephen Sotloff being beheaded by ISIS. Sotloff is the second American hostage to be executed by the terrorist group in two weeks. The killings have increased pressure on President Obama to take more decisive action. The president addressed the situation earlier today in Estonia. Whatever these murderers think they'll achieve by killing innocent Americans like Stephen, uh, they have already failed. They failed because 
like people around the world. Americans are repulsed by their barbarism. We will not be intimidated. And their horrific acts only unite us as a country and stiffen our resolve to take the fight against these terrorists. And those who make the mistake of harming Americans will learn that we will not forget and that our reach is long and that justice will be served. Joining me now from Texas A&M University is Ryan Crocker. He is the dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. He's also a former United States ambassador to Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. From Washington, Tom Friedman. He's the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the New York Times. His latest column is Ready, Aim, Fire, Not Fire, Ready, Aim. I am pleased to have both of them on this program at this important time. Uh, thank you for coming, both of you, Tom in Washington, Ryan in Texas. And Ryan, let me begin with you. You have said that the rise of ISIS presents the gravest threat to United States national security since 9-11. Let's assume that's true for a moment. What should we do? I think we need to take a number of interrelated steps. Um, first, we need to step up the tempo of our uh, airstrikes in Iraq, and we need to introduce them into Syria as soon as uh, uh, we've got uh, verified targets. ISIS erased the border between Iraq and Syria. Uh, we should take them up on it. Uh, secondly, we've got to have a political uh, uh, offensive, if you will. Uh, we have got to be in overdrive with the Iraqis to help them form an inclusive government uh, that will bring the Sunnis uh, back into coalition with the uh, Kurds and the Shia and present a, a common front on the ground uh, to, to ISIS. Uh, third, uh, we need to be also in overdrive on forming a regional and international coalition. We've got some opportunities coming up with the, uh, the NATO summit uh, tomorrow and Friday. Secretaries Kerry and Hagel will then be traveling to the region. Um, this isn't just our problem. Uh, this is a problem for the world, and the world needs to, uh, to step up to it. Uh, there are some things I think we shouldn't do. Um, I think we really have to be careful about even the perception of an association uh, with Iran. Uh, It'll be highly problematic for our Sunni Arab allies uh, and uh, likely to cause the uh, uh, Iraqi Sunnis to withdraw even further uh, from the process. And similarly, we've got to be very clear that we are not intervening in Syria uh, in support of the Assad regime. We are intervening in Syria uh, to combat a grave national threat to our, our own national security. Tom? Uh, you seem to disagree about in terms of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, about the threat to our national security. How do you see the moment and what should we do? Um, well, the point I was making just in half a line this morning was simply that ISIS today cannot threaten the American homeland. That was simply the point I was making. So let's, that, that meant for me that we, we have time to sit back and design the very kind of strategy that Ryan's talking about. And um, uh, as he laid out, this is really complicated and has to be done in a thoughtful and delicate way. First of all, it requires a platform, in a sense, a political platform that we can uh, stand on to launch military operations against. Um, uh, before you sat down in the chair, Charlie, Ryan and I were reminiscing about being in Beirut together 32 years ago uh, during the Lebanese Civil War and Sabra and Shatila. And one of the things I learned from that experience was watching the Marines come into Lebanon. And one of the conclusions that I drew from that experience is that when you have no political center, then everyone is aside. And the minute you intervene in Beirut, uh, 30 years ago, when there was no political center, the Marines became another side. In fact, the Lebanese used to call them the American militia. And what Ryan's suggesting and what I was suggesting in my column today is that without an Iraqi, uh, in effect, national unity coalition of Sunnis, Kurds, and Shiites, that we can be fighting for that to defend Iraqi national unity and a pluralistic future, not fighting on behalf of the Shiites or let alone the Shiites back or Iran, without that national unity platform um, intervening effectively in, uh, in the ISIS problem in a way that will uh, create a basis for some kind of political framework to be in place after we would leave, after the intervention would be over, 
um, uh, without that platform, you're really you're really going to have a problem. And that's why this is so so difficult. So um, the only thing I was reacting to this morning is that ISIS doesn't pose an immediate strategic threat to the American homeland. Therefore, not that we have years to deal with this problem, but we have time to think this through because this is really complicated. It seems to me that you both are articulating the point of view of the president of the United States. Where am I wrong about that, Ryan? Um, I, I, I hope you're not wrong. Um, what all of this takes, uh, what Tom and I have described in slightly different ways, um, is one key thing, American leadership. Uh, uh, I hope very much the president, uh, uh, when he goes to Wales, uh, is going to articulate uh, what's at stake here, uh, why there has got to be an international coalition, and then begin the process of forming it and of leading it. Uh, uh, so I, I hope uh, we're in complete sync. Uh, but so far, we haven't seen that American leadership yet. It starts with a vision, uh, and it's followed by a plan. We need both. We need them now. And I, I would take exception with Tom on one thing. Uh, uh, I think uh, ISIS uh, today is stronger, better armed, better funded, and more experienced uh, than the Al-Qaeda of Osama bin Laden that brought us 9-11. There are thousands of them who have Western passports, including Americans. So uh, I, I certainly wouldn't bet um, uh, the Capitol building uh, that they are unable at, at the present time to uh, carry out an operation uh, against the American homeland. Uh, it was chilling for all of us, the uh, beheadings of uh, uh, Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff. Uh, I was reminded of another beheading of, of Danny Pearl. Uh, right. That was done by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the principal operational architect of 9-11. Uh, it's the same ideology, just a lot more capability. Uh, Tom, you've recently interviewed the president. Where do you think the president is? Well, you know, um, I think Ryan's point about um, a kind of forceful leadership on this issue is is valid. I think that what what he's been focused on is that without a again a kind of political coalition there of Sunni Shiites and Kurds that can form the political backbone and foundation for any American intervention, we not only become either the Shiite Air Force or the Iranian Air Force, but after we leave, um, anything we achieve militarily would, um, uh, would not be sustainable. There'd be no political framework um, with, uh, to, to fill it, in a sense, the, the whatever, whatever we sweep away of, of ISIS. And so I think that's what, uh, that's what he's wrestling with. And um, about all I could, you, you, could uh, glean myself. As you have pointed out, Tom, in today's column, I think, um, as, as for Iran, if we defeat ISIS, it would be the third time since 2001 that we've defeated a key Sunni counterbalance to Iran, first the Taliban, then Saddam, now ISIS. This is not a reason not to do it, but it's a reason to do it in a way that does not detract us from the fact that Iran's nuclear program also needs to be diffused, otherwise it could undermine the whole global nonproliferation proliferation region, uh, regime, and that's tricky. Uh, Ryan, the interesting thing about this is that the recent advances against ISIS have included um, Iraqi militia that have been funded in the past by Iran. Iran seems to have a stake in this and a big-time stake. And that's why, uh, I think as Tom and I have both pointed out, we have got to be extremely careful uh, not to look like um, an ally of Iran or their uh, pretty awful collection of militias. Uh, and I think we do that, uh, as Tom and I have both suggested, uh, by ensuring that there is a solid Iraqi political foundation uh, that includes uh, Sunnis, Shia, and Kurds. What I, I don't believe is that we need to withhold uh, more forceful military action until that's achieved. I think they're symbiotic. Uh, I think when the Iraqis see us swing into action against a common enemy, it's going to help their political process. Uh, but I would underscore, uh, you're not going to get that political foundation by leaving it to the Iraqis to do themselves. 
Yeah. Uh, we're hardwired into their system. It only works when we're fully and heavily engaged. That's why Secretary Kerry's visit was so important. Uh, and it's going to take continued engagement. I know the White House has been working the phones. Uh, they're going to have to to keep at that uh, to get that necessary foundation. Uh, Tom, you, your column says ready, aim, fire, not fire, ready, aim. Do I detect, and I'm trying to get at, at how people can understand what we can do now and later and what are the fundamentals that we need to appreciate. Ryan seems to say we can't wait for all these under the, these foundations to develop. There is a military necessity now, and we have to act on that premise. Well, you know, I don't disagree with that. That's why I said use the term accompanied um, in conjunction with, and the two go together. Uh, when people see us uh, put skin in the game and lead, uh, they will respond to that. But it is tricky because there is a point where they will also say, um, we'll hold your coat. And that's why it's got to be really in tandem. Um, I, I, I'm all for you know, hitting ISIS targets um, uh, in Iraq or for that matter in Syria. I, I think it's, um, they should have no sanctuary. Uh, but I want to make sure we do that always in conjunction with them also doing the political and military equivalent on their side because their ability to abjure responsibility and to not make the hard political choices uh, is, is, uh, is expansive. And you only need to ask uh, the former U.S. ambassador to Iraq about that. Yes, and it was here. Um, the question also is Syria and Assad and how do we define our relationship with him in terms of what our policy has been uh, over the last couple of years? Ryan? Um, well, I, I said from the beginning that um, uh, simply saying that Assad must go isn't a policy. Uh, the fact of the matter is Assad wasn't going three years ago and he's not going today. Uh, that said, uh, it is a, a pretty horrible regime. Uh, Tom and I both know it. I spent three years there. Uh, uh, I think we do have to make clear uh, on any decision to intervene militarily in Syria uh, that we are in no way uh, supporting the Syrian regime in this. Uh, and we can catalog their sins, probably be a good idea. Uh, uh, we are defending our own national interest uh, against uh, a mortal enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, uh, I think if we are able to degrade uh, ISIS in Syria to some significant degree, uh, the primary beneficiary uh, would likely be exactly. uh, the more moderate elements of the Sunni opposition. Um, ISIS has, has done more damage to them, frankly, than he's done to Assad. Uh, it could also create a climate uh, in which uh, many who stand with Assad, not because they like him, they don't, uh, they feel the alternative is worse. If they no longer saw ISIS as that, that mortal threat to them, uh, you could see a dynamic developing within the regime community uh, that could make change possible, could make negotiation possible, and why not be wildly optimistic? Could make a settlement possible. We sure don't have those circumstances now. Tom? Yeah, I, um, I don't feel myself, Charlie, I'm going to defer to Ryan on that one, that I have a good grasp of the internal dynamics inside Syria right now. Um, but I know uh, one thing is necessary, though surely not sufficient, and that is, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to be in this game, you got to be in to win. And um, uh, you cannot be recognizing uh, borders against an enemy that doesn't recognize borders itself. And so uh, I think once we do feel we have, you know, political allies in the region um, uh, to work with us in tandem, um, you got to take the fight to them. You, you've got to hurt them, and you got to hurt them wherever they are. Okay, but I don't, that's just what I can't get beyond. When do we have? When are we confident we have political allies in the region? What is the necessary point that we reach before we do everything we can to attack ISIS without boots on the ground, but attacking ISIS and in conjunction with other forces on the ground? What's necessary now, uh, and what is the danger of of waiting? Well, bare minimum would be an Iraqi cabinet, an Iraqi government, which they're still, as I understand, still still forming. What do you think of the new prime minister? Um, uh, TBD, Charlie. I think uh, yeah. we really, he, he comes from the same party as Maliki. Um, Ryan probably knows him. You should ask him. Um, Ryan? 
I, I, I do know him, not well. Um, he, uh, he is out of the Dawa party, and uh, 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 I've seen nothing to suggest he doesn't support their ideology, uh, but clearly uh, he is not going to want to repeat the same mistakes Maliki made um, that have brought the country to this pass. So, uh, you know, I would be cautiously optimistic given intense U.S. engagement uh, and, and bringing in some other partners who may have some influence uh, is going to be essential to that process. They will not get it done on their own. And again, I would argue uh, this is complicated. Uh, you, you really can't have a, a sequence of events. Uh, you have to move on multiple fronts, militarily and politically, at the same time. Uh, I've argued that military action uh, is going to uh, uh, foster a political process, not hinder it. Uh, the Sunnis are, have been in the forefront of begging for active military intervention. Uh, you know, I talked to people out in Anbar uh, who've been fighting ISIS uh, since the spring, and they're afraid they're going to lose uh, Haditha, they're going to lose Ramadi, the, the capital of Anbar, uh, unless we do more and do it quickly. Uh, so the one thing that Iraqis seem to be able to agree on at this point uh, is uh, American military action is pretty important. You've got to galvanize the region. Now, King Abdullah had a statement uh, uh, that uh, uh, we should repeat back to him when he says uh, that ISIS will be in Europe uh, uh, this month and in the United States uh, the month after. Well, okay, uh, Your Majesty, let, let's get on with it together. Yep. Is this, in a broader way, a defining moment? I mean, uh, I, I know Secretary Kissinger has got a new book coming out about sort of a uh, sense of world order, but not so much that point, but a, but a finer point about how decisive this is as a moment in terms of, of that will influence the rest of the Middle East history in the same way, say, that the end of World War II did. I don't want to stretch this too far, but you both know too much not to ask the question. If I could, if I could take a shot at that, uh, I think it it can be a defining moment, um, and that definition could run either way. Uh, uh, what will define the moment, in my view, is um, uh, the strength and the capability of American leadership. Uh, uh, are we going to show the same kind of leadership we did after World War II, uh, and and shape a post Cold War order? Um, or are we going to sit back and let the centrifugal forces uh, uh, completely take over the process? Look, Charlie, one of the reasons this is such a mess is our friends in the region are all over the place. Uh, uh, the Saudis and the Qataris are, are backing different factions and different fights. Uh, the UAE is uh, on one page with Egypt. Uh, Turkey is on another page. Uh, I think there's a reason for that, and the reason is uh, we have not exercised the kind of sustained regional diplomacy uh, to get everybody on the same page. I, I look at what we did in the first Gulf War with uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, uh, a regional coalition, including, of all things, the Syrian division, uh, 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 and an international coalition. That would not have happened. Uh, without extremely strong and sustained presidential leadership. That's what we need now. Uh, I think the future of the region and our own security pivots on uh, whether that leadership is deployed and how deftly it is managed. I think there is a one difference between um, the 1991 Gulf War Coalition, which I you know, got to see assembled from the back of Secretary of State Baker's airplane, um, uh, and today. Um, and it is a problem that Obama has different from uh, George H.W. Bush um, uh, and his predecessors. And that is, um, they were still dealing with hard states, solid states. Um, so much of what Obama is dealing with are states that have come, up, come unstuck. And so um, you aren't just uh, required to kind of lead them in the right direction. There's an element almost of having to build their coherence. Um, and, and that's where I think, you know, why this is a, a defining moment, Charlie, is that, um, you know, we are basically seeing the end of uh, this is this is the real end of World War Two and the Ottoman World War One and the Ottoman Empire. That is, this is a region that is a pluralistic region 
That is, it's made up of many different community sects, tribes, um, and religions, but it's a region that has lacked pluralism. And um, so its pluralistic nature has been managed by the Ottoman Empire, then by the British and French, and then by iron-fisted kings and dictators. Its pluralistic um, uh, nature has been managed from the top down with iron fists. And what we have today, the situation we're in right now, is there's no Ottoman Empire to manage it from the top down, no British and French, and, and, and fewer and fewer kings and dictators. The region can no longer be managed vertically from the top down. It can only be managed horizontally now by the constituent communities. And this is what we see playing out in Iraq, finding a way to write their own social contract for how to live together in a pluralistic way. And that, that's the great challenge that's not only true for, for the Middle East, I think it's gonna be true globally. And the, the, it makes you, A, appreciate our own pluralism, and we only need to look at Ferguson, Missouri to know we are still a work in progress. But the fact that we have twice elected a, a black man whose middle name is Hussein, whose grandfather was a Muslim, who defeated a woman to run against a Mormon, um, uh, that is something that is so far from so many other countries around the world. But it's that kind of pluralism that ultimately is going to be required to manage this region. That's not going to happen overnight. It's probably not going to happen in any of our lifetime. But it can no longer be managed from the top down. ISIS is what happens when you have a pluralistic region without pluralism that can't write a social contract. And one group completely goes to the lunatic fringe. Um, we got to pull that back, but it can only be done by the other groups coming together and writing that kind of horizontal social contract for how to live together as equal citizens. And that's going to be really hard. And as Ryan said, it's going to a necessary but not sufficient ingredient is going to be American leadership. Uh, well, I, I, I would just echo that. Uh, uh, none of that is going to happen without American leadership. Uh, I would also agree that it's going to take more than that, it's going to take what that leadership brings in terms of buy-in from others. And it's going to take something that we always have in very short supply, strategic patience. Uh, because as Tom says, this is going to be decades, and we're going to have to stick with it because you don't get the kind of pluralism uh, that Tom talks about and that we develop painfully in this country uh, without a lot of engagement and a lot of patience. It seems to me also that, that the... You know, as you talk about American leadership and you talk about dealing with nation states versus non-nation states as we're dealing with here, uh, that, that the Sunni-Shia difference is out in the open and is being fought harder than I've ever seen it before. It is so clearly. And it's also now reflected in two uh, nation states engaged in a battle for influence in the region, on the one hand, Iran Shia and Saudi Sunni. Uh, so that it becomes enormously even more difficult. Uh, I also wonder, and I'm asked this as a question, I mean, does President Obama, who came to end war and conflict in the Middle East and, and in Afghanistan, you know, it, does he have the kind of mindset that wants to exert this kind of leadership, even if he recognizes it's true, because of some sort of essential mindset he has about how America has gotten mir mired down in the region too often before. Tom? I, I, th I think the legitimate critique from my point of view of Obama on all of this is that um, he came to office, uh, he ran on getting out of Iraq, um, getting out of Afghanistan. Um, he won a mandate, in effect, to do that. Um, but his mindset was all about getting out. Yes. It wasn't about getting out in a certain way, um, in a certain context that um, would leave something truly sustainable behind. I mean, he, he paid homage to that. He, he tipped his cap to it. But basically, uh, he wanted out. And um, I think that, you know, historians will, will debate and uh, hard and long about whether um, we got out in the right way at the right time. And now that's one reason we are being sucked back in. Yeah. And reluctantly uh, so I, by, then Tom, you argued often in many columns that I read that we needed a lot of nation building back home. And I think that's probably where the president's yeah. head was. Yeah, absolutely. And, my, and mine too, I, I, I have sympathy with it. We spent $2 trillion 
on this project um, in Afghanistan and Iraq, not to mention the lives of Iraqis, Afghans, Americans, and others. Um, and there are schools that aren't being built in America and roads that aren't being built because Sunnis and Shiites are still fighting over who's the proper heir to the Prophet Muhammad from the late 7th century. So uh, I, I understand and I, I, and I identify to some degree with that. It's, it's, it's finding the right balance in a, in a world that's now so connected where um, what happens there gets felt here. Ryan? Uh, I agree with much of what Tom said. Uh, what uh, we've learned all too painfully uh, is that you don't end a war simply by leaving the battlefield. Other people take it over. Uh, and, you know, I, I think what we're looking at in Iraq uh, reflects decisions that were made in, in 2010 uh, and, um, and 2011. Uh, those are the consequences we have today. You know, look, Charlie, I, I was in the Middle East almost four decades. Um, I, I learned maybe two things worth passing on. Uh, they're real simple. The first is be careful what you get into uh, if you're talking about a military intervention because it can have all kinds of unintended consequences, 30th and 40th order consequences that you can't plan for if you do any planning at all. And the second thing I learned is be just as careful over what you propose to get out of. The, the process of disengagement can have consequences as grave as those of intervention. And, and I would suggest to you we didn't do very well in Iraq in, in either case. And, and, you know, yeah, Charlie, let me, let me just add, those are Ryan's too, and they're very good ones. Um, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what he's learned in his four decades there and... and um, uh, I've been in and out of his offices out there for four decades. So uh, I've learned two things, too. Um, the thing I've learned is that um, the Middle East only puts a smile on your face when it starts with them, when it starts with them. That is when they want it. Uh, Camp David started between Israelis and Egyptians in Morocco. Oslo uh, was not called Dayton. It was called Oslo because Israelis and Palestinians got together a year before we even found out about it. And Anbar had to start with uh, Iraqi Sunni tribesmen wanting a different future. When it starts with them, when they have ownership, man, we can amplify and we need to and must amplify. Um, and the other thing I learned um, in 40 years there is that humiliation is the single most powerful human emotion. Um, and uh, we are dealing right now with a, with a civilization that is really struggling with modernity and, uh, uh, in the Arab Muslim world. And there's just enormous sense of being left behind. And the frustration that flows from that really can produce the kind of aberrant behavior we've seen uh, with ISIS and others. And how we partner with Arabs and Muslims to create the kind of co context where they can feel successful, where young people can feel that they can realize their full potential, which to me was what the Arab Spring was all about. Too many young people feeling they lived in context where they could not realize their full potential. Um, uh, you know, I think that's something that's got to be central to our, our policy there. So uh, those are the two things I've learned. Tom Friedman. Tom right. makes a Tom makes a great point um, on humiliation uh, for lots of good historical reasons. Uh, a sense of humiliation is deeply rooted in the Middle Eastern psyche. Uh, the obverse of that, of course, is respect. And as we move forward, I hope we move forward. Um, we need to keep that up front and central uh, uh, to be aware of the legacy of humiliation and of the importance of dealing with Middle Easterners on these thorny problems with respect. So what I hear coming out of this conversation are three words. One, respect, humiliation, and leadership. Often Four words, and ownership. And ownership. They need to own it too. Respect, ownership, leadership, and humiliation. Uh, often on this program at this table, people will write me and say, you know, I wish that's a conversation that could be heard at the White House. Um, I don't know what the president's hearing, but I thank you for uh, allowing the American public to hear this conversation at this time. Both of you uh, have my deepest thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank Thanks, you, Charlie. Ryan. It was a pleasure.